Welcome back to our series on deep learning for 3D object detection. In this video, we're going to show how you can use deep learning to train an object detector. Now, in order to do this, we have first cropped point clouds, split the data into a training and test set, and labeled the objects in each set. To learn more about these steps, check out the previous videos in this series. Now, we're ready to tackle training. So first, you're going to want to get the labels you exported from the LiDAR Labeler app, which is found here. Now, we have our Ground Truth LiDAR object in our workspace, but we need to format our labels in a way that's going to be easy to work with for deep learning. So I'm going to use this LiDAR object detector training data function here, and what that's going to do is it's going to take the Ground Truth and create something called a data store, which is essentially a way of looking at our data and then allowing us to read it in small chunks instead of all at once, which makes it easier to work with large data sets that would otherwise take up too much memory. It'll also make it really easy when we're working with our neural network later on in the video. So for example, let's say Avshek has a collection of point clouds. He's our data store in this instance. And I can say, can I have one point cloud, please? Yeah, sure. And so I'll take that one point cloud, I'll do what I need to do with it, and I'll move on. And data stores are customizable, so you can read in one piece of data at a time, one file at a time, a whole folder at a time, however much data you will need at any given time. To learn more about data stores, check out the video linked in the description. So this function here is actually going to create two data stores. One that'll import one point cloud at a time, and one that'll import all of the labels and label information for that frame of data at a time. And we'll also combine those two data stores just for ease of use. So if we preview this, we can see that it returns one point cloud, the location information for each of our objects of interest in that point cloud, and the labels for each located object, so whether it is a car, a barrel, or a cone. So now we've got our data formatted, but there are ways that we can make it a little more thorough, a little more robust, which would therefore make our detector a little more robust through a process called augmentation. Augmentation is when you add or manipulate a data set in a way that almost mimics having more training data. So real data sets, including ours, may be unbalanced in terms of how many objects they have of each class, or you know they're not going to represent every single possible scenario that your detector will encounter out in the real world. But augmentation can help overcome some flaws in your training data set and just help your detector be a little more prepared to tackle new data. Yeah, that makes sense, because when we're driving around, we are bound to see more cars than cones or barrels. Absolutely. And actually, in our data set, when I was labeling it, I noticed that we have a lot more cars than cones and barrels. So what we're going to do for this is just make it a little more evenly distributed. So we're going to start by using the sample LiDAR data function to go through all of our point clouds and extract samples of each object of interest. So it's going to take out the collection of points that represents a car, that represents the barrels, and represents the cones, and it's going to store all of those in files. And we can see here, this is an example of what a car might look like. This is actually a truck, specifically. And when it's done, you can see it's created this parking lot sampled folder. So if we go in here, we can see one folder for each object and I clicked on cars, and each mat file is going to contain points for one car. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to use this PCBbox over sample function, which will take random samples from our parking lot sampled folder and insert them into all of our point cloud frames. And so I've set here that I would like at least three of each object in every frame of data. And that'll, again, just give us some more training data for our neural network to learn from later. So I've specified that I want at least three mm -hmm. in each frame. When it's done running, we can go in and see, again, it's returned our oversampled data store has now returned a point cloud, a 10 by 9 double, so there's 10 detected objects, and 10 labels. And if we go in and look, we can see we've got our three cars randomly inserted. 
The cones are a little hard to see from here, but I'm pretty sure that's one here. And I happen to know that this frame already had four barrels in it, which is mm -hmm. why we're seeing a total of 10. Now, there are lots of different ways that you can augment your data. I've just shown you one, so I recommend checking out our documentation and looking into other opportunities and ways to augment your own data sets. Yeah, and it seems very useful when you don't have a big data set and you can just um, augment some more data and still train a good network. Absolutely. The data set we're using for this series is kind of small, especially in terms of a deep learning data set. So this is just one way of, like you said, creating a little more data and making some higher quality data. Once you're done processing your data, you're ready to get started with training your neural network. So we are going to use a point pillars network, which is a kind of 3D object detection architecture. And we're going to be performing transfer learning, which just means we're going to start with a pre-trained neural network. And we're going to fine tune it for our object detection needs. But the workflow will be very similar, if, even if you're starting from scratch. But when you're performing transfer learning, you just don't need quite as much data to tune the network as you would if you're starting from scratch. I guess that's very useful for like teams in competition places because uh, they don't get a lot of time to train it from scratch. And usually they also can record all that data for their training. So I think this would be very helpful for a lot of teams competing. Absolutely. Transfer learning can be a very helpful tool. The network we're going to use actually comes built in with MATLAB, so you'll be able to just load it right from here. Now, in order to configure our object detector, we are going to need three things. Class names, the anchor boxes, and the point cloud range, and of course, the actual network architecture. Now, we defined the class names earlier up here, so we can just use that variable. And we're going to use this calculate anchors point pillars helper function, which is included, to calculate our anchor boxes. And that's just going to go through all of our data and calculate the average bounding box size for each object, which gives the network an idea of what size and orientation it can expect each of the objects to be in, which makes it easier for it to detect it. And the point cloud range that you see here is the same one that we used earlier when we were cropping our point clouds. So I'm going to pass our pre-trained network, the point cloud range, the class names, and the anchor boxes to this point pillars object detector function. And that'll create a neural network that is ready to be fine-tuned. The last thing you need to do before you're ready to actually train the detector is specify how you want it to be trained. And there's a whole bunch of options available, so I encourage you to check out the documentation for training options. But for example, the kind of solver, we're using Atom, but there's a few other ones you can try. Max epochs is how many times you want the neural network to be trained on the entire training set. So for the purpose of this video, let's just do one. And mini batch size is actually how many reads to the data store. So in this case, how many point clouds and labeled objects you want to be training at a time. And that's just helpful for memory management. And a bunch of other ones, again, I encourage you to look at the documentation. But those are some of the important ones that you will need to be uh, adjusting for any kind of deep learning application. And um, I'm assuming all the options for the training is also something that you'll have to play with and tune it yourself, right? It's not one size fits all. Absolutely. Deep learning is an iterative process, and there's a reason there's so many options. Mm -hmm. There's no one set of options that is the correct one or that will always result in the best output. So depending on your data and on your uh, neural network, you should always be playing around with the training options. Now, train your neural network. So this is an example of what it might look like when you're done training your network. But we only did this for one epoch, just so we can show you. But I have trained a detector on 60 epochs, like you saw before. And I will load that into the workspace. And now we can use that on some new data. So this is just going in to read in the test set that we set aside earlier. And I've created a player so that we can see what's going on. And we're going to use the object detector to make predictions on every frame of our test set and visualize it as it goes. 
So I can see some bounding boxes. Yeah, we can see here that it's not perfect, but it's making some detections on the barrels, on some of the cars. Um, definitely room for improvement, but we can see that it is for sure making some detections. Now, this was sped up just for you to be able to get a sense of what it will look like. Now, Grace, is there anything else the students can do to improve the performance of the model? Absolutely. Like I said earlier, deep learning is an iterative process. So, there's so many things that you can adjust, kind of tweak, and see how it affects the outcome of your model. More training data is often better. High quality data is more important, but the more data you have for deep learning, the more likely you are to have a, a high quality, robust model. You can also play around with how you're splitting your training and test data. You can play around with different training options. Maybe you can perform more augmentation than we did in this series. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do to try and make your network more robust and more accurate. This is just kind of a starting point for a general workflow. Yeah, so once you have a 3D object detector that you're happy with, you can save it. So you don't have to do all the training again. Absolutely. Once you have it saved in a map file, you can start sharing it with others, you can start using it in your projects, or you can start deploying it, which we'll get to in the next video. So, to recap, data stores enable you to work with and modify large data sets, augmentation can help create more robust object detectors, and training a neural network is an iterative process, and you should try out different options, processing, and augmentation steps. The code used in this video is available on GitHub and File Exchange and can be found in the description of this video. If you have any questions or want to learn more, please check out these resources and feel free to reach out to us.